Welcome to Storytime Haven, where imagination comes alive. Today, we're diving into the heartwarming classic, A Little Princess. Join us as we follow the extraordinary journey of Sara Crewe, a young girl with an unbreakable spirit and a heart full of kindness. On a dreary London day, the city cloaked in a thick yellow fog, a carriage rattled over the cobblestone streets. Inside, nestled against her father, sat Sara Crewe, her wide, intelligent eyes taking in the unfamiliar sights. Though only seven years old, Sara possessed an air of quiet observation and a mind brimming with stories and dreams. Sara and her father, Captain Crewe, had journeyed from their home in India, a world away from this grey metropolis. Sara had spent her childhood surrounded by the vibrant colours and exotic sounds of India, a stark contrast to the sombre hues of London. Yet, she embraced this new adventure with her characteristic curiosity and optimism. Their destination was Miss Minchin's Seminary for Young Ladies, a prestigious boarding school where Sara was to begin her education. As the carriage approached the imposing building, Sara felt a mixture of excitement and apprehension. She had heard tales of boarding schools from other children, stories filled with strict rules, stern teachers and tearful goodbyes. The carriage pulled to a stop and Captain Crew stepped out, extending his hand to help Sarah down. They ascended the steps to the imposing front door, its brass knocker gleaming in the dim light. A moment later, the door creaked open, revealing a tall, thin woman with a stern expression. This was Miss Minchin, the headmistress of the seminary. Miss Minchin greeted Captain Crew with a forced smile, her eyes quickly assessing Sarah. Sarah, in turn, observed Miss Minchin with a discerning gaze. She noticed the sharp lines of her face, the tightness of her lips, and the calculating glint in her eyes. Sara instinctively sensed that Miss Minchin was not a woman to be trifled with. Captain Crewe introduced Sara, explaining that she was a new student at the seminary. Miss Minchin nodded curtly, then invited them into the dimly lit foyer. As they entered, Sara was struck by the hushed atmosphere and the faint scent of beeswax and lavender. The walls were adorned with portraits of stern-looking women, their eyes seeming to follow Sarah as she walked by. Miss Minchin led them into a parlour, where a fire crackled in the hearth, casting dancing shadows on the walls. She invited Captain Crew to sit and offered him tea, while Sarah perched nervously on the edge of a plush armchair. Miss Minchin inquired about Sarah's education and background, her tone brisk and businesslike. Captain Crew, a doting father, spoke glowingly of Sara's intelligence and imagination, highlighting her love of books and her ability to weave captivating tales. Miss Minchin listened politely, but Sara could tell she was unimpressed. Sara sensed that Miss Minchin valued conformity and discipline above all else, and Sara's vibrant personality did not fit neatly into that mold. After a brief conversation, Miss Minchin excused herself, stating that she needed to attend to other matters. Captain Crewe used this opportunity to offer Sara words of encouragement and reassurance. He reminded her of her intelligence, her kindness, and her ability to find joy in any situation. He told her that he would miss her dearly, but that he knew she would make the most of her time at the seminary. As the time for their parting drew near, Sara felt a pang of sadness. She had never been away from her father for an extended period, and the thought of being separated from him was daunting. However, she knew that this was an important step in her education, and she was determined to make him proud. Captain Crewe hugged Sara tightly, then turned to Miss Minchin and placed his daughter in her care. Miss Minchin led Sara to her dormitory, a large room filled with rows of narrow beds. Sara was assigned a bed near the window, and Miss Minchin instructed her to unpack her belongings and prepare for dinner. As Sara unpacked her trunk, she discovered that her father had secretly tucked away a small doll, a gift to remind her of his love. Clutching the doll, Sara gazed out the window at the darkening sky, her heart filled with a mixture of emotions. The first chapter of her new life had begun, and she was determined to face it with courage, kindness, and an unwavering belief in the power of imagination. The days following Sara's arrival at Miss Minchin's seminary were a whirlwind of new experiences. She quickly found herself the center of attention, not just because she was the new girl, but because of her extraordinary circumstances and her captivating personality. 
Captain Crew had spared no expense in ensuring his daughter's comfort and happiness. Sarah's trunk was filled with a treasure trove of exquisite clothes, delicate toys, and fascinating books. The other girls at the seminary, accustomed to simpler fare, were awestruck by Sarah's luxurious possessions. They watched in wide-eyed wonder as she unpacked her dresses of silk and velvet, her collection of miniature porcelain dolls, and her stack of leather-bound books with gilded edges. Sarah, however, was not one to flaunt her wealth. She shared her belongings freely, allowing the other girls to play with her dolls and borrow her books. Her generosity and kind spirit quickly endeared her to her classmates. Even the most reserved and shy girls found themselves drawn to Sarah's warmth and openness. Sarah's charm extended beyond her material possessions. She possessed a natural grace and a way of making everyone feel special and valued. She listened attentively to their stories, offered words of encouragement, and shared her own imaginative tales with gusto. She had a knack for finding the good in every situation and for inspiring others to see the world through her optimistic lens. The girls were particularly captivated by Sarah's stories. She had a gift for weaving words into vivid tapestries, transporting her listeners to far-off lands and fantastical realms. Her stories were filled with brave heroes, wise princesses, and magical creatures. They were a welcome escape from the mundane routine of the seminary. One evening, as the girls gathered around the fireplace in their dormitory, Sarah regaled them with a tale of a princess who was unjustly imprisoned in a tower. The princess, despite her dire circumstances, never lost hope or her belief in the power of good. She befriended a wise old owl who helped her escape from the tower and reclaim her kingdom. The girls listened with rapt attention, their eyes sparkling with wonder and admiration. When Sarah finished the story, there was a moment of silence, broken only by the crackling of the fire. Then, one of the girls, a shy, quiet girl named Ermengarde, spoke up. Sarah, she said softly, you're just like a princess yourself. The other girls nodded in agreement. You're always so kind and generous, added another girl, Lottie. And you always know how to make us feel better. You even have your own maid, chimed in Lavinia, a haughty girl who secretly envied Sarah's popularity. Just like a real princess, Sarah blushed at the compliments, her heart swelling with happiness. I'm not a real princess, she protested, but I'm glad you think of me that way. From that day on, Sarah became known as the little princess among her classmates. It was a title she wore with humility and grace, never letting it go to her head. She continued to befriend the lonely and the outcast, to share her possessions freely, and to inspire others with her stories and her unwavering optimism. The nickname, The Little Princess, was more than just a reflection of Sarah's material wealth. It was a testament to her character, her spirit, and her ability to bring light and joy to those around her. Even in the strict and sometimes harsh environment of Miss Minchin's seminary, Sarah's inner princess shone through, illuminating the lives of those who were fortunate enough to know her. Amidst the bustling energy of Miss Minchin's seminary, Sarah Crew, the little princess, found herself drawn to two girls who stood apart from the rest. Ermengarde St. John, a plump, timid girl with a perpetual blush, and Lottie Leg, a younger girl prone to emotional outbursts and tearful tantrums. Both seemed to exist on the fringes of the school's social circles. Ermengarde was perpetually overwhelmed by her studies, her mind struggling to grasp the complex lessons that came so easily to others. Her constant fear of failure and her inability to keep up with the pace of the classroom left her feeling isolated and inadequate. Lottie, on the other hand, was a whirlwind of emotions, her moods shifting rapidly from laughter to tears, from joy to despair. Her emotional outbursts often alienated her from the other girls who found her behavior unpredictable and tiresome. Sarah, with her empathetic heart and perceptive nature, recognized the loneliness and vulnerability in both Ermengarde and Lottie. She saw beyond their outward struggles and perceived the kind, gentle spirits that lay hidden beneath their insecurities. Driven by her innate compassion and her desire to make a difference, Sarah decided to extend her friendship to these two girls who needed it most. She approached Ermengarde first, sensing her deep-seated fear of failure. Sarah offered to help her with her studies, 
patiently explaining the difficult concepts and encouraging her to believe in herself. Ermengardi was initially hesitant, accustomed to being ridiculed for her academic shortcomings. But Sara's unwavering support and genuine belief in her abilities slowly chipped away at her self-doubt. Sara's approach to Lottie was equally compassionate. She recognized that Lottie's emotional outbursts stemmed from a deep-seated insecurity and a longing for love and acceptance. Sara responded with patience and understanding, offering a listening ear and a comforting embrace whenever Lottie's emotions threatened to overwhelm her. She made Lottie feel seen and heard, and she helped her to channel her emotions in more positive ways. Sara's friendship with Ermengarde and Lottie blossomed into a beautiful bond of mutual support and affection. The three girls found solace in each other's company, creating a safe haven where they could be themselves without fear of judgment or ridicule. They shared their dreams, their fears, and their hopes for the future. Together, they explored the hidden corners of the seminary, discovering secret nooks and crannies where they could escape the prying eyes of Miss Minchin and the other students. They shared stories, played games, and created their own imaginative worlds where anything was possible. Sara's influence on Ermengarde and Lottie was profound. Ermengarde, under Sara's tutelage, began to make progress in her studies. Her confidence grew, and she gradually shed her fear of failure. Lottie, with Sara's guidance, learned to manage her emotions more effectively. Her outbursts became less frequent and less intense, and she began to develop healthier relationships with the other girls. The friendship between Sara, Ermengarde and Lottie was a testament to the power of kindness, empathy, and compassion. It was a shining example of how one person's generosity and understanding could transform the lives of others. In a world that often seemed cold and harsh, their friendship was a beacon of warmth and hope. Miss Minchin, observing the growing bond between the three girls, was initially puzzled and then increasingly irritated. She saw Sarah's influence as a threat to her authority and her carefully constructed hierarchy. She tried to discourage their friendship, but Sarah's determination and unwavering loyalty to her friends proved too strong. In the end, Miss Minchin could do nothing but watch as Sarah, Ermengarde and Lottie continued to support and uplift each other. Their friendship, forged in the crucible of adversity, grew stronger with each passing day, a testament to the enduring power of human connection and the transformative power of kindness. Sara Cruz's world shattered on a bleak winter morning. Miss Minchin, her face grim and voice trembling with barely suppressed glee, delivered the devastating news. Captain Crew, Sara's beloved father, had perished from a fever contracted in India. His investments in diamond mines had proven disastrous, leaving his estate penniless. The fortune that had once adorned Sara's life, the lavish dresses, the exquisite toys, the endless books, had vanished like a mirage. The news struck Sara like a physical blow. The room seemed to spin, and the warmth of the fire in the hearth turned to icy chill. The image of her father, his kind eyes and gentle smile, filled her mind, but the vision was now tinged with the unbearable sorrow of loss. Tears welled up in her eyes, but she fought to maintain her composure, the words of her father echoing in her ears. Be brave, my little princess, and always remember who you are. Miss Minchin, seemingly oblivious to Sara's grief, wasted no time in outlining the drastic changes that would befall her life. With her father gone and her fortune lost, Sara was no longer a valued student at the seminary. She was a burden, an unwanted expense. Miss Minchin had decided, with a cold heart and a calculating mind, to keep Sara on as a servant. She would be moved to the attic, a dark, cramped space usually reserved for storage. She would be given the barest necessities, a thin mattress, a ragged blanket, a few scraps of food. Her education would be terminated, her once bright future extinguished. Sara listened to Miss Minchin's pronouncements with a growing sense of disbelief and despair. The world she had known, a world of love, privilege and endless possibilities, had crumbled around her. Yet amidst the crushing weight of grief and loss, a spark of defiance ignited within her. She would not let Miss Minchin break her spirit. She would not succumb to despair. With a heavy heart, Sara gathered her few remaining belongings and followed Miss Minchin up the creaky stairs to the attic. 
The room was as dismal as she had imagined. A cramped, dusty space with a single window overlooking the rooftops of London. The air was cold and damp, and the only furniture was a rickety bed and a small wooden chair. As Sarah looked around the room, a wave of desolation washed over her. This was to be her new home, a stark contrast to the luxurious room she had once occupied. Tears streamed down her face, but she quickly wiped them away. She would not give Miss Minchin the satisfaction of seeing her cry. With a determined spirit, Sarah began to make the attic room her own. She arranged her few belongings with care, placing the doll her father had given her on the bed. A reminder of his love and the happy times they had shared. She found a discarded piece of cloth and fashioned it into a curtain for the window, a feeble attempt to block out the chill and create a semblance of privacy. As the days turned into weeks, Sarah settled into her new life as a servant. She rose before dawn to light the fires, sweep the floors and carry coal and wood. She served meals to the other girls, her heart aching as she watched them enjoy the food she herself could barely stomach. She endured Miss Minchin's harsh words and Lavinia's cruel taunts, her pride wounded but her spirit unbroken. Despite the hardships, Sarah refused to surrender to despair. She found solace in her books, escaping into worlds of imagination and adventure. She befriended the scullery maid, Becky, a kind-hearted girl who shared her meager meals and offered words of encouragement. And she continued to believe, with an unwavering faith, that even in the darkest of times, there was always a glimmer of hope. The attic room, once a symbol of her degradation, became a sanctuary of sorts. It was here that Sarah retreated to dream, to imagine, and to find strength in her own resilience. It was here that she discovered the true meaning of being a princess. Not a princess defined by wealth and privilege, but a princess of the heart. A princess who faced adversity with courage, kindness, and an unwavering belief in the power of good. With Sarah Cruz fall from grace, Miss Minchin's true nature emerged from beneath the veneer of politeness she had previously maintained. The headmistress, who had once fawned over Sarah's wealth and connections, now revealed a heart filled with bitterness and a cruel streak that ran deep. Miss Minchin's transformation was swift and chilling. Her once saccharine smiles turned into sneers, her pleasantries replaced with cutting remarks. She seemed to relish Sarah's misfortune, taking every opportunity to remind her of her reduced circumstances. The once lavish meals Sarah had enjoyed were replaced with meager scraps, barely enough to sustain her. She was relegated to the coldest corner of the attic, shivering through the long winter nights with only a thin blanket for warmth. Her once elegant dresses were exchanged for worn, ill-fitting hand-me-downs, a constant reminder of her fall from grace. But Miss Minchin's cruelty went beyond physical deprivation. She delighted in humiliating Sarah, assigning her the most menial tasks and subjecting her to constant ridicule. Sarah was forced to scrub floors, empty chamber pots, and run errands in the pouring rain. Miss Minchin would often find fault with her work, criticizing her every move and berating her in front of the other students. Miss Minchin's harsh treatment extended to Sarah's education as well. Despite Sarah's pleas to continue her studies, Miss Minchin forbade her from attending classes, declaring that a servant had no need for learning. Sarah's beloved books were confiscated, and she was left with nothing but her memories and her imagination to sustain her. Lavinia, who had always envied Sarah's popularity, seized upon her downfall with glee. She became Miss Minchin's willing accomplice, tormenting Sarah with relentless taunts and insults. Lavinia would often flaunt her own privileges in front of Sarah, reminding her of the luxurious life she had once led. Sarah bore Miss Minchin's cruelty with a quiet dignity that belied her tender years. She refused to let the headmistress break her spirit. She clung to her father's words, reminding herself of her own worth and the importance of maintaining her integrity. In the face of adversity, Sarah's imagination became her refuge. She would retreat into her own private world, conjuring up fantastical scenarios where she was a princess, a queen, or a brave adventurer. She would imagine herself feasting on sumptuous meals, wearing beautiful clothes and traveling to exotic lands. These daydreams provided a much-needed escape from the harsh realities of her life. Sarah's resilience and inner strength did not go unnoticed. Becky, 
the scullery maid, witnessed Miss Minchin's cruelty with growing dismay. She offered Sara what little comfort she could, sharing her own meager meals and offering words of encouragement. Becky's kindness was a beacon of light in Sara's otherwise bleak existence. Even some of the other students, despite their fear of Miss Minchin, secretly sympathized with Sara. They would sneak her extra food or a warm garment, their small acts of defiance a testament to the enduring power of compassion. Miss Minchin, however, remained blind to Sara's suffering. Her heart had hardened, her soul consumed by greed and resentment. She saw Sara not as a child in need of care and compassion, but as a symbol of her own failures and disappointments. She projected her own bitterness onto Sara, punishing her for the sins of others. But Miss Minchin's cruelty could not extinguish the flame of hope that burned within Sara. She continued to believe in the power of good, the importance of kindness, and the enduring magic of the human spirit. She knew that her circumstances might be dire, but she refused to let them define her. She was, and always would be, a princess. A princess of the heart, a princess who refused to be broken. In the labyrinthine depths of Miss Minchin's seminary, where sunlight barely dared to tread, Sara Crew discovered an unexpected source of solace and companionship. It came in the form of Becky, a young scullery maid with a mop of unruly hair and eyes that held a quiet resilience. Becky's life was as far removed from Sara's former existence as one could imagine. She hailed from a poverty-stricken family, her days consumed by back-breaking labor and her nights spent in a cramped, airless room. Her clothes were threadbare, her face etched with the weariness of toil, and her spirit seemingly bowed by the weight of her circumstances. Yet, beneath the surface, Sara saw a spark of something more in Becky. She saw a flicker of kindness in her eyes, a hint of humor in her wry smile, and a quiet strength in her demeanor. Drawn by this hidden light, Sara sought out Becky's company, finding in her a kindred spirit who understood the hardships of life. Their initial encounters were brief and furtive, stolen moments in the dimly lit corridors or the bustling kitchen. Sarah, accustomed to the company of her well-bred classmates, found herself drawn to Becky's unvarnished honesty and her simple, straightforward manner. Becky, in turn, was initially wary of Sara. She had witnessed the transformation of the little princess into a servant, and she was hesitant to trust someone who had once belonged to a world so different from her own. But Sara's genuine kindness and her lack of pretension soon won her over. Their friendship blossomed in the quiet corners of the seminary, away from the prying eyes of Miss Minchin and the other students. They shared their stories, their hopes and their dreams. Sara, with her love of books and her fertile imagination, would often regale Becky with tales of far-off lands and fantastical adventures. Becky, in turn, would share stories of her own family and her struggles to make ends meet. Their conversations were a balm to Sara's wounded spirit. Becky's unfiltered honesty and her matter-of-fact acceptance of her lot in life were a refreshing contrast to the hypocrisy and superficiality of Miss Minchin and her student. S. Becky's presence reminded Sara that kindness and resilience could be found even in the most unlikely places. Their bond deepened as they shared the burdens of their respective lives. Sara would often help Becky with her chores, lightening her workload, and offering her moments of respite from the endless toil. Becky, in turn, would sneak Sara extra food, sharing her own meager rations with her friend. Their friendship was not without its challenges. Miss Minchin, ever vigilant, frowned upon their association. She saw Becky as a bad influence on Sara, a reminder of the poverty and hardship that Sara had supposedly escaped. But Sara refused to be deterred. She saw in Becky a true friend, someone who valued her for who she was, not for her former status or her material possessions. Sara's friendship with Becky was a lifeline in her darkest hours. Becky's unwavering support and her quiet strength helped Sara to endure the hardships of her new life. She reminded Sara that even in the face of adversity, it was possible to find joy, hope, and meaning in life. Their bond was a testament to the power of human connection, the importance of empathy, and the enduring strength of the human spirit. It was a reminder that friendship could blossom in the most unexpected places, and that true friendship transcended social barriers and material differences. In the heart of India, a land steeped in mystery and intrigue, lay a secret that held the key to Sara Cruz's destiny. 
Her father, Captain Crewe, a man of adventure and ambition, had embarked on a daring venture years ago. He had invested his fortune in a series of diamond mines, lured by the promise of untold riches and a life of luxury for his beloved daughter. The diamond mines, shrouded in secrecy and guarded by fierce tribesmen, were said to contain a treasure trove of precious gems. But their exact location remained a mystery, known only to a select few. Captain Crewe, ever the optimist, had shared his dreams with Sara, painting vivid pictures of sparkling diamonds and a future filled with endless possibilities. However, fate had dealt a cruel hand. Captain Crewe's untimely demise had left the location of the diamond mines shrouded in uncertainty. The documents detailing the mines' whereabouts had seemingly vanished, leaving Sara with nothing but fragments of her father's tales and a glimmer of hope that the diamonds might still be found. The news of Captain Crewe's failed investment and the elusive diamond mines reached Miss Minchin's seminary like a whisper on the wind. It fueled the headmistress's disdain for Sara, confirming her belief that the girl was nothing more than a penniless orphan with no claim to the privileges she had once enjoyed. Sara, however, clung to the memory of her father's stories. She recalled the excitement in his voice as he described the diamond mines, the sparkle in his eyes as he spoke of the riches they would bring. She refused to believe that his dreams had been in vain. In the solitude of her attic room, Sara would pore over the few remaining documents her father had left behind. She studied maps of India, tracing her fingers over the vast expanse of land, searching for clues that might lead her to the hidden mines. She read books about geology and diamond mining, eager to learn everything she could about the precious gems that held the key to her future. Sara's interest in the diamond mines was not merely driven by the desire for wealth. It was a connection to her father, a way to keep his memory alive. She believed that finding the mines would be a way to honor his legacy and fulfill his dreams for her. Her quest for the diamond mines became a source of strength and resilience. It gave her a purpose, a reason to persevere in the face of adversity. She refused to let Miss Minchin's cruelty or Lavinia's taunts dim her hope. She knew that somewhere out there, in the heart of India, lay the answer to her prayers. The diamond mines, once a distant dream, became a symbol of Sara's unwavering spirit and her determination to overcome the challenges that life had thrown her way. They were a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there was always the possibility of a brighter future. Sara's unwavering belief in the diamond mines would eventually lead her on an extraordinary journey, a journey that would test her courage, her resilience, and her faith in the power of dreams. It would be a journey filled with unexpected twists and turns, a journey that would ultimately lead her to the truth about her father's legacy and her own destiny. The attic room, once a haven of warmth and light, transformed into a frigid prison as winter descended upon London. The icy winds howled through the cracks in the walls, and the feeble warmth from the single candle Sara was allowed barely made a dent in the biting cold. The thin blanket provided little comfort, and Sara often lay awake shivering, her teeth chattering, her stomach gnawing with hunger. Miss Minchin, in her callous disregard for Sarah's well-being, had reduced her meals to mere scraps. A slice of stale bread, a watery soup, a few withered vegetables. The once lavish feasts Sara had enjoyed were a distant memory, replaced by the constant gnawing pangs of hunger. As the days grew shorter and the nights colder, Sarah's physical strength dwindled. Her cheeks grew hollow, her eyes sunken, her once vibrant spirit dimmed by the relentless hardships she endured. Yet, even in the face of such deprivation, Sarah refused to surrender to despair. She drew strength from the memories of her father, his love and encouragement a beacon of light in the darkness. She clung to the stories she had read, the tales of brave heroes and resilient heroines who had overcome seemingly insurmountable odds and she found solace in her own imagination, conjuring up visions of warmth, comfort, and abundance. One particularly cold night, as Sara lay shivering beneath her threadbare blanket, her stomach growling with hunger, she decided to take matters into her own hands. She rose from her bed, her movements slow and deliberate, and made her way to the window. The city lay before her, a vast expanse of twinkling lights, a reminder of the warmth and comfort that existed beyond the confines of her attic prison. 
Sara gazed at the lights for a long moment, her heart filled with a mixture of longing and determination. Then, with a deep breath, she closed her eyes and began to imagine. She imagined herself sitting at a grand table, laden with delicious food, roast chicken, steaming vegetables, fresh bread, and a pitcher of creamy milk. She imagined the warmth of the fire on her face, the soft touch of a blanket on her skin, the comforting sound of laughter and conversation. As Sarah's imagination took flight, the attic room seemed to transform. The cold air grew warmer, the darkness gave way to a soft golden glow. The scent of roast chicken filled the air, and the sound of laughter echoed in her ears. For a brief moment, Sarah forgot her hunger and her cold. She was transported to a world of warmth and abundance, a world where her dreams were reality. The experience, though fleeting, gave her the strength to endure. It reminded her that even in the darkest of times, the power of imagination could provide a much-needed escape, a source of hope and resilience. The next morning, Sara woke with a renewed sense of determination. She would not let hunger and cold defeat her. She would find a way to survive, to thrive, to rise above her circumstances. With a newfound resolve, Sara set about her daily chores. She scrubbed floors with vigor, her movements quick and efficient. She carried coal and wood with a newfound strength, her back straight, her head held high. She even managed to find a few scraps of food to supplement her meager rations, foraging in the kitchen garden for edible plants and scavenging for crumbs in the dining hall. Sara's spirit, though tested, remained unbroken. She had found a way to survive, to find joy in the smallest of things, and to hold on to the hope that one day her fortunes would change. In the cold, barren attic of Miss Minchin's seminary, a magical transformation took place each night. As darkness fell and the chills seeped into her bones, Sara Crew, the once pampered little princess, embarked on extraordinary journeys of the mind. In the realm of her imagination, she escaped the harsh realities of her life, finding solace and nourishment in the most unlikely of places. The catalyst for these fantastical adventures was often a simple object, a crust of bread, a wilted leaf, a stray button. Sara would hold the object in her hand, her eyes sparkling with an inner light, her lips curving into a gentle smile. With a few whispered words and a flourish of her hand, she would transport herself to a world of her own creation. One night, clutching a crust of bread, Sara imagined herself in a grand banquet hall, surrounded by elegantly dressed guests. The table before her groaned under the weight of a sumptuous feast. Roast goose with crispy skin, mashed potatoes swimming in gravy, plump sausages bursting with flavor, and a towering chocolate cake dripping with icing. Sarah savored each bite in her mind, the flavors exploding on her tongue, the warmth spreading through her body. Another night, holding a wilted leaf, Sarah envisioned herself strolling through a lush garden, the air filled with the sweet scent of jasmine and roses. She plucked ripe berries from the vines, savoring their juicy sweetness, and sipped cool lemonade from a crystal goblet. The sun warmed her skin, and a gentle breeze rustled through the leaves, creating a symphony of nature's music. With a stray button as a talisman, Sarah transformed her attic room into a cozy cottage, complete with a crackling fire, a soft armchair, and a table laden with delectable treats. Steaming hot cocoa, buttery scones, and a plate of freshly baked cookies. She curled up in the armchair, the warmth of the fire chasing away the chill, and lost herself in a captivating book, her imagination soaring with the characters on the page. Sarah's imaginary feasts were not merely a distraction from her hunger and cold. They were a testament to her indomitable spirit, her refusal to let her circumstances define her. They were a source of strength and resilience, a reminder that even in the face of adversity, the human mind could create its own reality. In her imaginary world, Sarah was not a servant, but a princess, a queen, a powerful sorceress. She was not bound by the limitations of her physical reality, but free to explore the limitless possibilities of her mind. Her imaginary feasts also served as a source of comfort and connection. She would often invite her friends, both real and imagined, to join her at her elaborate banquets. She would share her food with them, listen to their stories, and offer words of encouragement and support. These imaginary gatherings reminded Sarah that she was not alone, 
that even in the most isolating of circumstances, she could find companionship and love. Miss Minchin, unaware of Sara's secret world, dismissed her imaginative flights as childish fantasies. She saw Sara's daydreams as a sign of weakness, a futile attempt to escape from the harsh realities of her life. But Sara knew better. She understood that her imagination was her greatest asset, a tool that allowed her to transcend her circumstances and find joy in the midst of adversity. Sarah's imaginary feasts became a daily ritual, a source of nourishment for both her body and her soul. They fueled her creativity, her resilience, and her unwavering belief in the power of good. They were a testament to the enduring power of the human spirit, a reminder that even in the darkest of times, the light of hope could never be extinguished. In the grand house next door to Miss Minchin's seminary, a solitary figure resided, Mr. Tom Carrisford, a wealthy Indian gentleman with a past shrouded in mystery and a heart burdened by sorrow. He'd returned to England after years spent amassing a fortune in India, seeking solace and perhaps a sense of belonging in his homeland. However, his health had deteriorated and he found himself increasingly confined to his home his only companions his loyal servants and a mischievous pet monkey. From his window, Mr. Carrisford often observed the comings and goings of the seminary girls, their laughter and chatter a stark contrast to the quiet solitude of his own life. One day, his attention was drawn to a small, thin figure clad in a worn coat, her face pale but her eyes bright with an inner fire. It was Sarah Crewe, the little princess turned servant, performing her daily chores with a grace and dignity that belied her circumstances. Mr. Carrisford watched Sarah with a growing sense of intrigue. He was struck by her resilience, her unwavering spirit in the face of adversity. He saw in her a reflection of his own struggles, a reminder of the strength and determination it took to overcome life's challenges. He learned of Sarah's story from his servants, her fall from grace, her mistreatment at the hands of Miss Minchin, her unwavering belief in the power of imagination. The more he learned, the more he admired her. He saw in her a kindred spirit, a fellow survivor who refused to be broken by life's trials. Mr. Carrisford's interest in Sarah grew into a quiet fascination. He would often watch her from his window, observing her as she performed her chores, her head held high, her spirit unbroken. He was particularly intrigued by her habit of retreating to the attic window each night, her face illuminated by the flickering light of a single candle. One night, curiosity getting the better of him, Mr. Carrisford asked his servant, Ram Das, to investigate the attic room next door. Ram Das, a loyal and discreet servant, climbed onto the roof and peered through the attic window. He saw Sarah sitting on her bed, a book in her lap, her face aglow with the joy of reading. Ram Das returned to Mr. Carrisford with his report describing Sarah's meager belongings, her threadbare clothes, and the single candle that provided her only source of light and warmth. Mr. Carrisford listened intently, his heart filled with a mixture of pity and admiration. That night, Mr. Carrisford made a decision. He would not stand idly by while Sarah suffered. He instructed Ram Dass to discreetly deliver a basket of food and warm blankets to the attic room. He wanted to offer Sarah a glimmer of hope, a reminder that she was not alone in her struggles. The following morning, Sarah woke to find the basket at her door. She was overwhelmed with gratitude, her heart filled with a renewed sense of hope. She knew that someone, somewhere, cared about her well-being. Mr. Carrisford's act of kindness marked the beginning of a silent bond between the two. He continued to send Sarah small gifts, a doll, a book, a warm shawl each one a symbol of his support and encouragement. Sarah, though unaware of the identity of her benefactor, cherished these gifts, treasuring them as a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there was always kindness to be found in the world. Mr. Carrisford's interest in Sarah was not merely philanthropic. He saw in her a spark of something special, a potential that transcended her circumstances. He believed that Sarah, with her intelligence, her imagination, and her unwavering spirit, was destined for great things. His fascination with Sara grew into a quiet obsession. He spent hours pondering her story, imagining the trials she had endured and the dreams she held dear. He longed to meet her, to offer her the support and guidance she so desperately needed. But he knew that his own health 
and the social conventions of the time made such a meeting impossible. For now, Mr. Carrisford would have to be content with watching Sara from afar, offering his silent support and his unwavering belief in her potential. He knew that their paths would cross again someday, and when they did, he would be there to help her claim her rightful place in the world. In the neighboring mansion, a small creature was experiencing an adventure of its own. Mr. Carrisford's pet monkey, a mischievous and curious bundle of energy named Surya, had grown weary of the confines of his gilded cage. He longed for the freedom to explore, to climb, to swing from the chandeliers, much to the dismay of Mr. Carrisford's servants. One afternoon, while the servants were distracted, Surya seized his opportunity. With a deft maneuver, he managed to unlatch the cage door and scamper out into the grand house. He scampered through the hallways, his tiny heart pounding with excitement, his eyes wide with wonder. He climbed up curtains, swung from chandeliers, and even managed to snatch a few sweets from the dining table before making his daring escape through an open window. Surya found himself on the roof, the city sprawled out before him like a giant playground. He scampered across the rooftops, leaping from chimney to chimney, his agility and sense of balance honed by years of jungle life. As dusk approached, he found himself perched on the roof of Miss Minchin's seminary, his curiosity piqued by the sounds of laughter and chatter emanating from the windows below. His eyes were drawn to a single window in the attic, where a faint light flickered. Driven by an inexplicable urge, Surya made his way down the sloping roof, clinging to the eaves with his nimble fingers. He reached the attic window and peered inside. The sight that greeted him was unexpected. In the dimly lit room, a young girl sat huddled on a bed, a book in her lap. Her face, though pale and thin, was illuminated by a gentle smile, and her eyes sparkled with an inner light. Surya had never seen anyone like her before. She seemed so different from the boisterous children who lived in the mansion next door. Intrigued, Surya pushed open the window and slipped into the room. Sara, startled by the sudden intrusion, looked up to see the monkey perched on the windowsill, its bright eyes fixed on her. For a moment, they stared at each other in silence, a sense of unspoken understanding passing between them. Sara, who had always loved animals, was instantly charmed by Soria's playful antics. She offered him a piece of bread, which he accepted with a grateful squeak. Soria, in turn, seemed drawn to Sara's gentle nature and her quiet strength. He hopped onto her bed and nestled in her lap, his tiny body trembling with cold and exhaustion. Sarah wrapped her arms around Surya, her heart filled with a warmth she had not felt in a long time. The monkey's presence was a welcome distraction from her own troubles, a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there was always the possibility of companionship and joy. From that day on, Surya became Sarah's constant companion. He would spend his days exploring the attic, swinging from the rafters, and playing with the few toys Sara had managed to keep. He would curl up beside her at night, his warmth a comforting presence in the cold room. Surya's presence had a profound effect on Sara. He brought laughter and joy into her life, reminding her of the simple pleasures that could be found even in the midst of adversity. He was a loyal and devoted friend, always there to offer a comforting touch or a playful distraction. The other girls at the seminary were initially wary of Surya, but Sara's affection for the monkey soon won them over. They would often gather in the attic to watch Surya's antics, their laughter echoing through the otherwise quiet room. Even Miss Minchin, though she disapproved of the monkey's presence, could not deny the positive effect it had on Sara. Surya's arrival in Sara's life was a gift, a reminder that even in the most unlikely places, friendship and companionship could be found. He was a symbol of hope and resilience, a testament to the enduring power of the human-animal bond. The biting wind of a winter afternoon whipped through the cobbled streets of London, carrying with it a symphony of sounds. The clatter of horse, drawn carriages, the calls of street vendors, the muffled conversations of passers-by bundled in thick coats. Amidst the throng, a small figure emerged from Miss Minchin's seminary. Her head bowed against the wind, her thin frame shivering in the cold. It was Sara Crewe, her once vibrant spirit dimmed by the harsh realities of her new life. She clutched a single sixpence in her hand, her last remaining coin, a relic of the wealth she had once taken for granted. Hunger gnawed at her stomach, 
a constant reminder of the meager scraps she was now forced to subsist on. As Sarah walked, her eyes scanned the streets, taking in the familiar sights and sounds. She passed by a baker's shop, the warm aroma of freshly baked bread wafting out into the cold air. Her stomach growled in protest, but she knew that the sixpence was not for her. She had a different destination in mind. Sarah's footsteps led her to a corner of the street where a young beggar girl huddled, her clothes tattered, her face gaunt with hunger. The girl's eyes were fixed on the passers-by, a silent plea for help etched on her face. Sarah paused, her heart aching with compassion. She recognized the desperation in the girl's eyes, the gnawing hunger that mirrored her own. Without hesitation, she approached the girl and held out the sixpence. Here, she said softly, her voice barely a whisper, this is for you. The girl looked up, her eyes wide with surprise and gratitude. She took the coin, her fingers trembling as she clutched it tightly. Thank you, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Thank you so much. Sarah smiled, a warmth spreading through her despite the cold. She had nothing else to offer, but she knew that the sixpence would make a difference. It would buy the girl a loaf of bread, a warm meal, a moment of respite from the harsh realities of life on the streets. As Sarah turned to leave, the girl reached out and grabbed her hand. Wait, she said, her voice stronger now. What's your name? Sarah, replied Sarah softly. Sarah, the girl repeated, her eyes shining with a newfound hope. Thank you, Sarah. You're an angel. Sarah blushed, her heart swelling with emotion. She had never been called an angel before, but the girl's words rang true. In that moment, Sarah felt a sense of purpose, a connection to something greater than herself. She had given away her last sixpence, but she felt richer than she had ever been before. She had given from her heart, without expectation of reward, and in doing so, she had touched another human being's life. As Sarah walked back to the seminary, her footsteps lighter, her heart filled with warmth, she realized that her father's words had been prophetic. Be kind to all, and remember that even the smallest act of kindness can make a big difference. Sarah's act of kindness towards the beggar girl was not just a demonstration of her selfless nature. It was a testament to her unwavering belief in the power of good, her refusal to let her own hardships harden her heart. It was a reminder that even in the midst of suffering, compassion and generosity could flourish, bringing light and hope to a world often shrouded in darkness. The sixpence, though small and insignificant, had a ripple effect that extended far beyond that cold winter afternoon. It ignited a spark of hope in the heart of a young beggar girl, a spark that would eventually grow into a flame of resilience and self-reliance. And it solidified Sarah's own sense of purpose, reminding her that even in her reduced circumstances, she had the power to make a difference in the world. In the heart of Sarah Crew, a flame flickered, a beacon of hope that refused to be extinguished. It was a belief in the inherent goodness of the world, a conviction that even in the darkest of times, magic existed. This belief, nurtured by her father's stories and her own vivid imagination, became her anchor, her lifeline, her source of strength in the face of adversity. Sarah's belief in magic was not a naive delusion, but a profound understanding of the power of the human spirit. She believed that the world was not merely a collection of cold, hard facts, but a place where dreams could take flight, where kindness could triumph over cruelty, and where the impossible could become possible. Her belief in magic manifested itself in many ways. It was in the way she saw the world, always seeking out the beauty and wonder hidden beneath the surface. It was in the way she interacted with others, treating everyone with kindness and respect, regardless of their social standing or their circumstances. And it was in the way she faced her own hardships, refusing to let them dim her spirit or extinguish her hope. Sarah's attic room, though cold and bare, became a haven of magic. It was here that she retreated to read, to dream, to imagine. It was here that she conjured up fantastical worlds where she was a princess, a queen, a brave adventurer, it was here that she found solace in the company of her imaginary friends, sharing her hopes and fears, her joys and sorrows. Her belief in magic extended beyond the realm of her imagination. It influenced her actions, her interactions, and her outlook on life. When she saw a beggar on the street, she didn't see a dirty, ragged figure, 
but a fellow human being in need of kindness and compassion. When she was faced with Miss Minchin's cruelty, she didn't see a heartless tyrant, but a woman who was herself trapped in a prison of bitterness and resentment. Sarah's belief in magic was not a passive acceptance of fate, but an active engagement with the world. She believed that she had the power to shape her own destiny, to create her own happiness, and to make a difference in the lives of others. Her unwavering optimism and her belief in the power of good were contagious. The other girls at the seminary, though initially skeptical, were gradually drawn to Sarah's light. They found themselves inspired by her courage, her kindness, and her unwavering faith in the future. Even Becky, the scullery maid, who had seen the worst of human nature, was touched by Sarah's spirit. She witnessed firsthand the transformative power of Sarah's belief in magic. The way it lifted her spirits, gave her strength, and allowed her to endure the hardships of her life. Miss Minchin, however, remained blind to the magic that surrounded Sarah. She saw only a stubborn, defiant child who refused to accept her lot in life. She dismissed Sarah's dreams and aspirations as childish fantasies, her kindness and generosity as signs of weakness. But Miss Minchin's cynicism could not diminish the power of Sarah's belief. It shone through her actions, her words, and her very being, a beacon of hope in a world that often seemed dark and despairing. Sarah's magic was not a supernatural force, but a human one. It was the magic of love, of kindness, of hope, of resilience. It was the magic that could be found in the most ordinary of moments, a shared meal, a kind word, a comforting embrace. Sarah's belief in magic was not a cure-all for her problems, but it was a source of strength that helped her to endure. It gave her the courage to face her fears, the compassion to forgive her enemies, and the hope to believe in a better future. In the end, Sarah's magic was not just a personal belief, but a gift to the world. It was a reminder that even in the darkest of times, the human spirit could triumph, that kindness could conquer cruelty, and that dreams could become reality. In the desolate attic of Miss Minchin's seminary, where shadows danced and dust motes swirled in the dim light, an unlikely friendship blossomed. Sarah Crew, the little princess's turned servant, found solace and companionship in the most unexpected of creatures, a small brown rat with bright, inquisitive eyes. The rat, whom Sarah affectionately named Melchizedek, had taken up residence in the attic, Drawn by the warmth of the fireplace and the occasional crumbs Sarah inadvertently left behind. At first, Sarah was startled by the rat's presence. She had always been taught to fear and despise rodents, their presence associated with filth and disease. But Melchizedek was different. He was not a menacing creature lurking in the shadows, but a curious and intelligent being, eager to explore his surroundings. He would often venture out from his hiding place, his whiskers twitching, his nose sniffing the air, his eyes fixed on Sarah with an almost human-like curiosity. Sarah, who had always loved animals, found herself drawn to Melchizedek's gentle nature and his playful antics. She would leave him small morsels of food, which he would accept with a grateful squeak. In return, Melchizedek would entertain Sarah with his acrobatic feats, scampering up the walls, balancing precariously on the rafters, and even performing a few somersaults for her amusement. Their friendship grew with each passing day. Melchizedek would often curl up beside Sara as she read, his warmth a comforting presence in the cold attic room. He would listen attentively as she told him stories, his whiskers twitching in response to her words. He became her confidant, her silent companion, a source of comfort in her loneliness. One particularly cold night, as Sara shivered beneath her thin blanket, Melchizedek snuggled up to her, his small body radiating warmth. Sarah stroked his fur, her heart filled with gratitude for his presence. She realized that even in the most desolate of places, friendship and companionship could be found. Melchizedek's presence also had a profound effect on Sarah's outlook on life. He taught her to see the world from a different perspective, to appreciate the simple joys of life and to find beauty in the most unexpected places. He showed her that even creatures often reviled by society could possess kindness, intelligence, and a capacity for love. He taught her to judge others not by their appearance or their social standing, but by their character and their actions. 
Sara's friendship with Melchizedek was not without its challenges. Miss Minchin, ever vigilant, discovered the rat's presence in the attic and was appalled. She demanded that Sara get rid of him, threatening to punish her if she refused. But Sara, emboldened by her friendship with Melchizedek, stood her ground. She explained to Miss Minchin that Melchizedek was her friend, that he provided her with companionship and comfort, and that she would not betray his trust. Miss Minchin, though irritated by Sara's defiance, grudgingly allowed the rat to stay. She could not deny the positive effect Melchizedek had on Sara. The girl's spirits had lifted, her eyes sparkled with a newfound joy, and her resilience in the face of adversity had grown stronger. Sara's friendship with Melchizedek was a testament to the power of connection, the importance of empathy, and the enduring strength of the human spirit. It was a reminder that love and companionship could be found in the most unexpected places, and that true friendship transcended species and social barriers. Winter's icy grip tightened around London, casting a chill that seeped into every corner of Miss Minchin's seminary. The biting winds howled through the eaves, rattling the windows and sending shivers down the spines of the inhabitants. In the attic room where Sara Crew resided, the cold was particularly harsh. The thin blanket she had been given offered little protection, and she often woke with frost on her eyelashes and a numbness in her fingers and toes. Sara had learned to endure the cold, drawing upon her resilience and imagination to create warmth in her heart, if not her body. She would huddle beneath her blanket, her loyal companion Melchizedek nestled beside her for warmth, and lose herself in the worlds of her books. Her imagination conjuring up images of crackling fires and steaming bowls of soup. One evening, as Sara prepared for bed, she noticed a peculiar sight. A small package wrapped in brown paper rested on the floor near her bed, seemingly having appeared out of nowhere. Intrigued, Sara picked up the package and carefully unwrapped it. Inside, she found a treasure trove of warmth and comfort, a thick woolen blanket, a pair of soft knitted socks, a warm hat, and a pair of sturdy gloves. A small note tucked inside the package simply read, for the little girl in the attic, Sarah's heart swelled with gratitude and a flicker of hope ignited within her. Someone had noticed her plight. Someone cared enough to provide for her needs. The anonymous gift was a lifeline, a tangible expression of kindness in a world that often seemed cold and uncaring. The warmth of the blanket, the softness of the socks, the sturdy protection of the gloves, each item felt like an embrace, a reminder that she was not alone in her struggles. Sarah donned the warm clothes with a sense of wonder and appreciation, her body thawing, her spirit lifted. The following morning, Sarah set about her chores with a renewed sense of energy and purpose. The cold no longer seemed as daunting, the tasks no longer as burdensome. The knowledge that someone cared enough to provide for her had given her a newfound strength and resilience. As the days passed, Sarah continued to receive anonymous gifts, a warm coat, a pair of boots, a basket of fresh fruit and bread. Each gift was a testament to the kindness and generosity of her unknown benefactor. Sarah's heart swelled with gratitude, and she longed to express her thanks, but she had no way of knowing who her benefactor was. The gifts not only provided physical warmth and comfort, but also nourished Sarah's soul. They reminded her that even in the darkest of times, there was always the possibility of kindness and generosity. They gave her hope, a belief that her circumstances could change, that her future was not as bleak as it seemed. The identity of Sarah's benefactor remained a mystery, a source of speculation and intrigue among the girls at the seminary. Some whispered that it was a fairy godmother, others suggested it was a guardian angel. Sarah herself had no answers, but she cherished the gifts and the sense of hope they brought. Unbeknownst to Sarah, her benefactor was none other than Mr. Carrisford the reclusive Indian gentleman who lived next door. He had witnessed Sarah's suffering from his window and had been moved by her resilience and her unwavering spirit. He wanted to help her, to provide her with the warmth and comfort she so desperately needed. Mr. Carrisford's acts of kindness were not motivated by a desire for recognition or reward. He simply wanted to make a difference in Sarah's life, to offer her a glimmer of hope in the midst of her hardships. He saw in Sarah a reflection of his own struggles, a reminder of the importance of compassion and generosity.
The gifts he sent were a tangible expression of his empathy and his belief in Sara's potential. They were a testament to the power of human connection, the ability of one person's kindness to make a profound difference in the life of another. The tranquility of Miss Minchin's seminary was disrupted one crisp autumn morning by the arrival of a new pupil. Lavinia Herbert, a girl of considerable wealth and a haughty demeanor, swept into the school, her entourage of trunks and hat boxes following in her wake. Her arrival was met with a flurry of excitement and curiosity, the students eager to catch a glimpse of the latest addition to their ranks. Lavinia was a striking figure, with her dark curls cascading down her back, her piercing blue eyes surveying her surroundings with an air of disdain, and her lips perpetually turned down in a frown. She carried herself with an air of entitlement, her every movement conveying a sense of superiority over her peers. From the moment she set foot in the seminary, Lavinia made it clear that she was not like the other girls. She spoke in a condescending tone, her words laced with sarcasm and veiled insults. She flaunted her expensive clothes and jewelry, her every possession a symbol of her family's wealth and social standing. Lavinia quickly established herself as the queen bee of the school, her wealth and arrogance attracting a coterie of followers eager to bask in her reflected glory. She ruled the schoolyard with an iron fist, dictating the latest fashions, the most popular games, and the social hierarchy. Sarah Crewe, who had once held the title of Little Princess, observed Lavinia's ascent with a mixture of amusement and pity. She had seen through Lavinia's facade of confidence, recognizing the insecurity and the desperate need for approval that lurked beneath the surface. Lavinia, in turn, viewed Sarah with a mixture of envy and contempt, she resented Sarah's popularity, her ability to charm even the most aloof of students. She was particularly envious of the genuine affection Sarah received from the other girls, a stark contrast to the sycophantic admiration Lavinia commanded. Lavinia's jealousy festered and grew, fueled by her own insecurities and her insatiable desire for attention. She began to undermine Sarah's popularity, spreading rumors about her, questioning her motives, and belittling her achievements. She would often make snide remarks about Sarah's worn clothes and her lack of material possessions, a cruel reminder of her fall from grace. Sarah, however, refused to be drawn into Lavinia's petty games. She continued to treat everyone with kindness and respect, her unwavering spirit a testament to her inner strength. Her refusal to retaliate only fueled Lavinia's anger, driving her to even greater acts of cruelty. Lavinia's jealousy reached its peak when she learned of Sara's nightly ritual of storytelling. She overheard the other girls whispering about Sara's imaginative tales, their voices filled with wonder and admiration. Lavinia, who had never possessed a creative bone in her body, was consumed with envy. One night, determined to sabotage Sara's popularity, Lavinia crept up to the attic room and listened at the door. She heard Sara's voice, soft and melodic, weaving a tale of a young princess who overcame adversity through her courage and kindness. Lavinia's heart twisted with rage and envy. She could not bear the thought of Sara being admired and loved, while she herself was merely tolerated for her wealth and social standing. In a fit of spite, she burst into the room, her face contorted with anger. Stop your silly stories, she shrieked, her voice echoing through the attic. You're nothing but a pauper, a servant. You have no right to pretend to be something you're not. Sara, startled by the intrusion, looked up at Lavinia with a mixture of surprise and pity. She had seen the darkness in Lavinia's heart, the emptiness that fueled her cruelty. Lavinia, she said softly, I'm sorry you feel that way, but my stories are not meant to hurt anyone. They're meant to bring comfort and joy, to remind us that even in the darkest of times, there is always hope. Lavinia's anger only intensified. She grabbed Sara's book and threw it across the room, the pages scattering like fallen leaves. You're a liar, she spat. You're nothing but a pitiful orphan who deserves everything she gets. With that, Lavinia stormed out of the room, leaving Sara to pick up the pieces of her shattered story. But Sara's spirit remained unbroken. She knew that Lavinia's cruelty stemmed from her own insecurities, her own inability to find joy and meaning in life. Sara would not let Lavinia's bitterness poison her own heart. She would continue to believe in the power of good, the importance of kindness, and the enduring magic of the human spirit. She knew that one day, 
Lavinia would realize the error of her ways, and perhaps, with a little kindness and understanding, she too could find happiness and peace. The air hung heavy with tension in the once cheerful dormitory. Lavinia Herbert, her face contorted with rage, stood amidst a scattering of open drawers and overturned trinket boxes. Her shrill voice pierced the silence, accusations flying like daggers. It's gone. My mother's brooch. It's gone. And she's the only one who could have taken it. Her finger, trembling with fury, pointed directly at Sara Crew, who stood frozen, her face pale with shock and disbelief. The other girls huddled in the corner, their eyes wide with fear and curiosity. Lavinia, Sarah began, her voice barely a whisper. I assure you, I have not touched your brooch. But Lavinia was beyond reason. Her jealousy and resentment towards Sarah, fueled by the latter's sudden wealth and popularity, had reached a boiling point. This was her chance to strike back, to humiliate and ostracize the girl she had come to despise. Don't lie to me, you little thief, Lavinia shrieked, her voice rising to a hysterical pitch. You're always sneaking around, poking your nose where it doesn't belong. I knew you couldn't be trusted. Sarah's heart pounded in her chest. She had never stolen anything in her life, and the mere accusation was a deep insult. But she knew that protesting her innocence would only fuel Lavinia's rage. Lavinia, please, Sarah pleaded, her voice trembling. Let me help you find it. Perhaps it's simply misplaced. But Lavinia would not be appeased. Misplaced? She scoffed. It was right here, in this very box, just this morning. And now it's gone, and you were the only one in the room. The other girls exchanged uneasy glances. They knew Lavinia's penchant for drama and exaggeration, but they also knew that Sarah was an easy target. The seeds of doubt had been sown, and the whispers of suspicion began to spread. Miss Minchin, alerted by the commotion, arrived on the scene. Her stern face hardened as she took in the chaotic scene. What is the meaning of this uproar? She demanded, her voice echoing through the dormitory. Lavinia, eager to play the victim, launched into a tearful recounting of her missing brooch, painting Sarah as a cunning and opportunistic thief. Sarah listened, her heart sinking with each accusation. She knew that Miss Minchin had never favored her, and this incident would only solidify her prejudice. Sarah Crew, Miss Minchin said, her voice cold and accusing. Is this true? Have you stolen Lavinia's brooch? Sarah met her gaze with quiet dignity. No, Miss Minchin, she replied, her voice unwavering. I have not, but Miss Minchin was not convinced. I have no choice but to conduct a search, she declared. If the brooch is found in your possession, you will be expelled from this institution. Sarah's heart sank even further. She knew that Lavinia had hidden the brooch, but she had no way to prove it. She could only hope that Miss Minchin's search would uncover the truth. The search was thorough and invasive. Every inch of Sarah's belongings was scrutinized. Her room turned upside down, her privacy violated. But the brooch was nowhere to be found. Lavinia, sensing victory, smirked triumphantly. See? She crowed. She's hidden it well, but she can't fool us forever. Sara felt a wave of despair wash over her. She had been accused of a crime she did not commit, and her reputation was tarnished. But she refused to give up hope. I am innocent, Miss Minchin, she said, her voice firm. I believe that the truth will eventually come to light. Miss Minchin, however, was not interested in the truth. She had already made up her mind. Until the brooch is found, she declared, you will be confined to your room. You are forbidden from attending classes or interacting with the other girls. Sara was devastated. She had worked so hard to build a life for herself at the seminary, to make friends and excel in her studies. Now, it was all crumbling before her eyes. Confined to her room, Sara tried to maintain her composure. She spent her days reading, writing, and daydreaming. But the isolation took its toll. She missed her friends, her studies, and the simple joy of exploring the world outside her window. One day, as she was staring out at the bustling city below, she noticed a small, glittering object on the ledge outside her window. It was Lavinia's brooch, glinting in the sunlight. Sarah's heart leaped with joy. The truth had finally been revealed. With trembling hands, she opened the window and retrieved the brooch. She held it up to the light, marveling at its intricate design 
and the way it sparkled like a captured star. Then, with a newfound sense of purpose, she marched down to Miss Minchin's office. The headmistress looked up in surprise as Sara entered, her face flushed with excitement. Miss Minchin, Sara said, her voice ringing with triumph. I have found the brooch. She held out her hand, revealing the glittering object. Miss Minchin gasped, her face pale with shock and disbelief. Where did you find it? She stammered. It was outside my window, Sara replied, her voice calm and steady. Someone must have placed it there. Miss Minchin's eyes narrowed. She knew that Lavinia was the culprit, but she was reluctant to admit her mistake. She had already punished Sara, and to acknowledge her innocence would be a blow to her pride. But Sara would not be silenced. I demand an apology, Miss Minchin, she said, her voice firm. I have been falsely accused and unjustly punished. I deserve to have my reputation restored. Miss Minchin, cornered, had no choice but to comply. With a grudging apology, she lifted Sara's punishment and reinstated her privileges. Lavinia, her scheme exposed, was humiliated and ostracized by the other girls. Her reputation was tarnished, her power diminished. Sara, on the other hand, emerged from the ordeal stronger and more resilient than ever. She had faced adversity with grace and courage, and her unwavering belief in the truth had ultimately prevailed. The stolen brooch incident marked a turning point in Sara's life. It had tested her character, strengthened her resolve, and reinforced her belief in the importance of justice and fairness. It had also taught her a valuable lesson about the power of forgiveness and the importance of moving forward with grace and dignity. The rhythmic thudding of footsteps overhead jolted Sara awake. She squinted at the alarm clock. 3.12 a.m. A groan escaped her lips as she rolled over, tugging the covers tighter around her. But the thudding persisted, growing louder and faster. Sara sat up, heart pounding. Was someone in the attic? A flicker of orange light danced across the ceiling. Fear clenched Sarah's gut. Fire. She scrambled out of bed, raced to the door, and flung it open. Thick, acrid smoke billowed down the hallway. The smoke alarm wailed, its shrill cry barely audible above the roaring inferno consuming the attic. Sarah's mind raced. The stairs were engulfed in flames, the only escape route blocked. She slammed the door shut and stumbled back into her room. Her phone. Where was her phone? She fumbled through the darkness, her lungs burning from the smoke seeping under the door. Finally, her fingers brushed against the cold metal. Frantically, she dialed 911. Help. My house is on fire. I'm trapped in my bedroom on the second floor. Sarah screamed into the phone. The dispatcher's calm voice reassured her. Help is on the way. Can you get to a window? Sarah raced to the window and threw it open. A blast of cold night air hit her face, a welcome relief from the stifling heat. Below, the lawn stretched out, a daunting two-story drop. There's no way I can jump from here, she cried. Listen to me, the dispatcher urged. Stay calm, breathe through a cloth if you can. We're almost there. Sarah grabbed a pillowcase from her bed and held it over her mouth and nose. The smoke thickened, filling her lungs with each gasping breath. Her eyes stung and her head spun. She leaned out the window, desperate for air. Below she heard sirens wailing. Red and blue lights flashed through the trees. A fire engine screeched to a halt and firefighters jumped out, their movements swift and purposeful. One of them shouted through a megaphone. Ma'am, can you hear me? Sarah waved her arms, tears streaming down her face. I'm here, up here. The firefighter aimed a ladder towards her window. It extended upwards, reaching closer and closer. Sarah's heart soared with hope. But as the ladder neared, a section of the roof collapsed, showering sparks and debris. The ladder jerked back, the firefighter losing his grip. Sarah screamed in terror as the ladder crashed to the ground. The firefighter lay motionless, a dark figure sprawled on the lawn. Desperation washed over Sarah. She was trapped, her only lifeline severed. The fire raged, growing hungrier with each passing second. She staggered back from the window, choking on the smoke. Her legs gave way, and she crumpled to the floor, the pillowcase slipping from her grasp. 
As her vision blurred, she caught a glimpse of the attic door, its frame glowing orange. The fire was breaching her room. With the last of her strength, Sarah crawled towards the door. The heat seared her skin, but she pushed on, driven by a primal instinct for survival. She reached the door and braced herself against the wall. If she could just manage to close it, she might buy herself a few more precious minutes. Sarah slammed her body against the door, forcing it shut with a deafening crash. The impact sent a shockwave through her, and she collapsed, her senses fading. Vaguely, she heard muffled voices and the sound of splintering wood. A cool breeze brushed against her face, and strong arms lifted her from the floor. Sara clung to her rescuer, coughing and gasping for air. As she was carried out of the house, she caught a glimpse of the attic, now a raging inferno. Flames licked at the window frame, their hungry tongues reaching for the night sky. Sara shivered, the cold air a stark contrast to the searing heat she had just escaped. She was placed on a stretcher, her body racked with coughs. A paramedic checked her vitals and administered oxygen. Sarah's eyes fluttered open, and she scanned the faces of the firefighters and paramedics surrounding her. Thank you, she croaked, her voice barely a whisper. A firefighter knelt beside her, a reassuring smile on his face. You're safe now, ma'am. We've got you. Sarah's gaze drifted to the house, its silhouette stark against the backdrop of flames. Her home, her sanctuary, was consumed by the hungry inferno. Tears welled up in her eyes, but she blinked them back. She was alive, and that was all that mattered. The ambulance sped away, sirens wailing, leaving behind the scene of devastation. Sara closed her eyes, exhausted but grateful. She had survived the attic fire, a night of terror that would forever be etched in her memory. The smoke thickened, swirling around Sara like a malevolent specter. It crept into her lungs, a burning, acrid presence that stole her breath and clouded her vision. Her head swam, the room tilting and swaying as the flames gnawed at the edges of her sanctuary. Through the haze, she heard a muffled sound, a thud, followed by a series of frantic scrabbling noises. Sarah's heart leaped with a flicker of hope. Could it be the firefighters? Had they found a way in? But the sounds were wrong, too frantic, too desperate. This wasn't a trained rescue team. A shadowy figure emerged from the smoke, a turbaned head bent low as it navigated the obstacle course of overturned furniture and fallen debris. Ram Das, Mr. Carrisford's Indian servant, materialized before Sara's disbelieving eyes. Miss Sara, he cried, his voice a beacon of hope in the choking darkness. We must leave now. Ram Das scooped Sara into his arms, his wiry frame surprisingly strong. He moved with a swiftness that belied his age, weaving through the smoke-filled room towards the window. The heat intensified with every step, the flames reaching out with eager fingers. Sarah clung to Ram Das, her body racked with coughs. She buried her face in his shoulder, seeking solace in the familiar scent of spices and incense that always clung to his clothes. How did you get in? She gasped, her voice barely audible above the roar of the fire. The back stairs, Miss Sara. Ram Das replied, his words punctuated by grunts of effort. They are still passable, but we must hurry. He reached the window and flung it open, the blast of cold air a shock to Sara's overheated body. Below the lawn stretched out, a dizzying drop that made her stomach churn. I can't jump, she whimpered, her voice thick with fear. I will lower you, Miss Sara, Ram Das assured her. Trust me. He draped a blanket over the windowsill to protect Sara from the rough edges of the brick, then carefully lowered her out the window, his strong hands gripping her waist. Sara dangled precariously, her eyes squeezed shut against the dizzying sight of the ground rushing up to meet her. Ram Das eased her down inch by inch, his voice a steady murmur of encouragement. Almost there, Miss Sara, just a little further. Finally, Sara's feet touched solid ground. She collapsed onto the grass her body trembling with relief and exhaustion. Ram Das quickly followed, swinging himself out the window with surprising agility. As they lay on the lawn, catching their breath, the full force of their escape hit Sara. She had been plucked from the jaws of death, saved by the most unlikely of heroes. Thank you, Ram Das, she whispered, her voice choked with emotion. You saved my life. Ram Das smiled, his eyes twinkling in the firelight. It was my duty, Miss Sara. 
You are like family to me. Sarah's heart swelled with gratitude. In that moment, she realized that family wasn't just about blood ties. It was about the bonds of love and loyalty that transcended social barriers and cultural differences. Together, they watched as the flames engulfed her home, the once familiar rooms transformed into a fiery inferno. Sarah's eyes filled with tears as she mourned the loss of her possessions, her memories, her sanctuary. But amidst the grief, a sense of peace settled over her. She had survived, thanks to the courage and quick thinking of a man she had once dismissed as a mere servant. Ram Das had not only saved her life, but had also taught her a valuable lesson about the true meaning of family. As the fire raged on, Sara and Ram Das made their way to the street, where a crowd of neighbors and emergency responders had gathered. Sara was immediately surrounded by concerned faces, offering blankets and words of comfort. She was checked over by paramedics, who assured her that she was unharmed aside from some minor smoke inhalation. In the aftermath of the fire, Sara and Ram Das were taken in by a kind neighbor. The community rallied around them, offering food, clothing, and shelter. Sara was overwhelmed by the outpouring of support, a testament to the kindness and generosity of the human spirit. As she settled into her temporary home, Sara's thoughts turned to the future. Her house was gone, her possessions reduced to ashes. But she knew that she was not alone. She had Ram Das, her loyal friend and protector, and the support of a community that had embraced her as one of their own. Sarah's heart filled with a newfound determination. She would rebuild her life, stronger and more resilient than before. And she would never forget the debt she owed to Ram Das, the humble servant who had risked his life to save hers. Mr. Carrisford's study was a sanctuary of hushed tones and leather-bound volumes. It was a room where decisions were made, fortunes forged, and secrets kept. On this particular evening, however, the air crackled with an unspoken tension, a sense of anticipation hanging heavy in the dim light. Sarah sat across from Mr. Carrisford, her hands clasped tightly in her lap. The firelight flickered across her face, highlighting the exhaustion etched into her features. Yet, her eyes held a newfound resolve, a quiet strength that had emerged from the ashes of her ordeal. I cannot thank you enough for your kindness, Mr. Carrisford, Sarah began, her voice barely a whisper. You have taken me in, clothed me, fed me. I am forever in your debt. Mr. Carrisford raised a hand, his expression unreadable. It was the least I could do, child. You have suffered a great loss. A moment of silence stretched between them, the only sound the ticking of the grandfather clock in the corner. Sarah took a deep breath, steeling herself for what she was about to reveal. Mr. Carrisford, she began, her voice gaining strength. There is something I must tell you, something about my past. Mr. Carrisford leaned forward, his interest piqued. Go on, child. Sarah recounted her life story, starting with her childhood in India and her father's untimely death. She spoke of her mother's struggles and their eventual journey to England. She shared her dreams of finding a better life, of escaping the poverty that had plagued her family for generations. As Sarah spoke, Mr. Carrisford's expression shifted, a flicker of recognition dawning in his eyes. He interrupted her, his voice sharp with sudden urgency. What was your father's name? Sarah hesitated, unsure of why this detail mattered. His name was Ralph Crewe. A gasp escaped Mr. Carrisford's lips. He leaned back in his chair, his face pale. A tremor shook his hand as he reached for a crystal decanter and poured himself a glass of brandy. Ralph Crewe, he murmured, his voice barely audible. My old business partner, my dear friend. Sarah's heart pounded in her chest. Could it be? Was there a connection between her father and this enigmatic man? Mr. Carrisford took a sip of brandy, his eyes fixed on the fire. Your father and I were involved in a diamond mining venture in India, he began, his voice heavy with memories. We were on the brink of a great discovery, a fortune that would have changed our lives. He paused his gaze drifting to a framed photograph on his desk. It was a picture of two men, their arms slung around each other's shoulders, their faces etched with youthful ambition. But tragedy struck, Mr. Carrisford continued, his voice thick with emotion. There was an accident at the mine. Your father, he didn't survive. Sarah's eyes filled with tears. She had never known the details of her father's death. 
only that it had occurred in India. Mr. Carrisford reached for a leather-bound journal, its pages yellowed with age. After your father's death, I returned to England, heartbroken and disillusioned. I brought with me this journal, containing all of our plans and notes regarding the diamond mine. He handed the journal to Sara, who opened it with trembling hands. The pages were filled with intricate maps, geological surveys, and calculations. It was a treasure trove of information, a testament to her father's dedication and expertise. As Sara delved deeper into the journal, a realization dawned on her. The diamond mine, the fortune her father had sought, it was real, and she as his sole heir was entitled to it. Mr. Carrisford watched her, his expression a mixture of sadness and hope. Your father was a brilliant man, Sara. He had a vision, a dream of a better life for his family. And now, that dream can become a reality. Sarah looked up, her eyes shining with newfound determination. With your help, Mr. Carrisford, I believe it can. A smile spread across Mr. Carrisford's face, the first genuine smile Sarah had seen since their initial meeting. Indeed it can, my dear. Indeed it can. In that moment, an unspoken agreement was forged between them. Sarah, the penniless orphan, and Mr. Carrisford, the wealthy businessman, united by a shared past and a common goal. Together, they would embark on a journey to reclaim what was rightfully hers, to fulfill her father's dream, and to secure her own future. The transformation was as swift as it was astounding. Overnight, Sarah Crewe went from being a humble servant to a wealthy heiress, her life irrevocably altered by the revelation of her true identity and the restoration of her rightful inheritance. The news spread through the city like wildfire, whispered in hushed tones at social gatherings and splashed across the headlines of the morning papers. Sara Crew, the little drudge who had scrubbed floors and polished boots, was now a diamond heiress, her fortune rivaling that of royalty. Mr. Carrisford, once a distant figure of authority, became Sara's guardian and confidant. He took it upon himself to guide her through the intricacies of her newfound wealth, introducing her to lawyers, bankers, and financial advisors. Sara, once overwhelmed by the simplest of tasks, now found herself navigating a world of investments, trusts, and estates. The attic room, once her refuge from the harsh realities of her life, was transformed into a luxurious suite fit for a princess. Fine fabrics draped the windows, plush carpets cushioned her footsteps, and gleaming furniture adorned the once bare walls. Yet, amidst the opulence, Sarah never forgot the lessons she had learned in poverty. Her first act as a wealthy heiress was to ensure the well-being of her friends. Becky, the scullery maid who had shared Sarah's hardships, was given a generous stipend and a comfortable cottage of her own. Ermengarde, the timid classmate who had always admired Sarah's intelligence and kindness, was enrolled in a prestigious boarding school where she could finally flourish. Sarah even extended her generosity to Miss Minchin, the stern headmistress who had treated her with such cruelty. Though she could have easily sought revenge, Sarah chose forgiveness. She arranged for Miss Minchin to receive a modest pension, ensuring her financial security in her old age. As Sarah's reputation grew, so did her circle of acquaintances. She was invited to balls and soirees, where she dazzled the elite with her charm, intelligence, and impeccable manners. Yet she never lost sight of her humble beginnings, always treating everyone with respect and kindness, regardless of their social standing. One day, as Sara was strolling through the park, she encountered a familiar figure. It was Lottie, the spoiled little girl who had once tormented Sara with her tantrums and demands. Lottie was now a young woman, but her demeanor remained unchanged. She was still selfish, demanding, and utterly oblivious to the needs of others. Sarah approached Lottie, a gentle smile on her face. Hello, Lottie, she greeted her. Do you remember me? Lottie stared at Sarah, her eyes widening in recognition. Sarah Crew, she exclaimed, her voice laced with disbelief. But you're, you're rich. Sarah nodded, her smile unwavering. Yes, Lottie, I am. But that doesn't change who I am, does it? Lottie was speechless, her mind struggling to reconcile the image of the ragged servant girl with the elegant young woman before her. Sara took the opportunity to speak to Lottie, not with scorn or judgment, but with compassion and understanding. 
She shared her own experiences of hardship and loss, of the importance of kindness and empathy. She encouraged Lottie to look beyond her own privileged bubble and to see the world through the eyes of others. Lottie listened, her heart softening with each word. For the first time in her life, she saw Sarah not as a lowly servant, but as a role model, a shining example of resilience, compassion and grace. As time went on, Sarah's influence extended beyond her immediate circle. She used her wealth and position to advocate for the less fortunate, establishing schools, orphanages and hospitals. She became a beacon of hope for those who had been marginalized and forgotten, a symbol of the transformative power of kindness and generosity. Sarah's life was a testament to the triumph of the human spirit. She had risen from the depths of despair to the heights of success, never losing sight of her values or her compassion for others. Her story was a reminder that even in the darkest of times, hope could flourish, and that true wealth lay not in material possessions, but in the richness of the human heart. The ornate drawing room of Miss Minchin's Select Seminary for Young Ladies was a far cry from the cold, austere attic where Sarah Crew had once slept. Sunlight streamed through the tall windows, illuminating the plush carpets and polished furniture. Yet, a shadow hung over the room, a palpable tension that had nothing to do with the decor. Miss Minchin sat stiffly on a velvet chaise, her face a mask of barely suppressed fury. Beside her, Lavinia Herbert fidgeted nervously, her usual arrogance replaced by a veneer of fear. They had been summoned by Sarah Crew, the former student they had treated with such disdain and cruelty. The door opened, and Sarah entered the room, her presence radiating warmth and grace. She was no longer the ragged servant girl they remembered, but a vision of elegance and poise. Her clothes were of the finest silk, her jewels sparkled in the light, and her demeanor exuded confidence and serenity. Miss Minchin rose to her feet, her voice laced with forced politeness. Miss Crewe, she said, her tone dripping with sarcasm. To what do we owe this unexpected visit? Sarah smiled, her eyes twinkling with amusement. I have come to offer you my forgiveness, Miss Minchin. The words hung in the air, stunning both Miss Minchin and Lavinia into silence. Forgiveness? From the girl they had tormented and humiliated? It was inconceivable. Miss Minchin's face contorted with rage. Forgiveness? She spat. You dare to speak of forgiveness after the way I treated you? Sarah's smile remained unwavering. I do, Miss Minchin, because I have learned that forgiveness is not about condoning the actions of others. It is about freeing ourselves from the chains of resentment and anger. Lavinia, who had been observing the exchange with growing unease, finally found her voice. But Sarah, she stammered, we were so cruel to you. We deserve to be punished. Sarah shook her head gently. No, Lavinia, you were young and foolish. You acted out of jealousy and insecurity. But I believe that everyone has the capacity for good, even those who have strayed from the path. Miss Minchin's anger began to dissipate, replaced by a mixture of shame and disbelief. She had never considered the possibility that Sarah could forgive her, let alone offer her compassion. I... I don't understand, she confessed, her voice barely a whisper. Why would you forgive us? Sarah stepped closer, her eyes filled with compassion, because holding on to anger and resentment only hurts ourselves, Miss Minchin. It poisons our hearts and minds, preventing us from experiencing true joy and peace. She reached out and took Miss Minchin's hand, her touch gentle but firm. Let go of the past, Miss Minchin. Forgive yourself. Forgive Lavinia and allow yourself to heal. Tears welled up in Miss Minchin's eyes, tears of shame, regret, and ultimately, gratitude. She had been given a second chance, an opportunity to redeem herself. Lavinia, too, was moved by Sarah's words. She had always been envious of Sarah, her beauty, her intelligence, her unwavering spirit. But now, she saw Sarah in a new light, as a beacon of hope and forgiveness. Sarah, Lavinia whispered, her voice choked with emotion. I'm so sorry for everything. Sarah embraced Lavinia, her heart filled with compassion for the young woman who had once been her tormentor. I forgive you, Lavinia, she whispered. We all make mistakes. The important thing is to learn from them and to strive to be better. The tension in the room lifted, replaced by a sense of peace and reconciliation. Sarah had not only forgiven her former tormentors, 
but she had also shown them a path towards redemption. In the days that followed, Sarah's act of forgiveness had a profound impact on Miss Minchin and Lavinia. Miss Minchin, humbled by Sarah's generosity, made significant changes to the seminary, creating a more nurturing and supportive environment for the students. She even reached out to former students who had suffered under her harsh regime, offering them apologies and restitution. Lavinia, inspired by Sarah's example, began to shed her selfish ways. She volunteered at local charities, befriended those she had once scorned, and made a conscious effort to be kinder and more compassionate. Sarah's act of forgiveness had not only healed the wounds of the past, but had also paved the way for a brighter future, one filled with hope, understanding, and the transformative power of love. The handsome cab rattled over the cobblestone streets of London, its rhythmic clatter a stark contrast to the turmoil within Sarah Crewe's heart. She gazed out the window, her eyes tracing the familiar landmarks of the city she had called home for the past decade. But today, everything looked different. The once imposing building seemed smaller, the bustling crowds less daunting. A sense of liberation mingled with a pang of nostalgia as she bid farewell to her past. The cab pulled up outside the imposing gates of Miss Minchin's select seminary for young ladies. The sight of the wrought iron gates and the austere facade of the building sent a shiver down Sarah's spine. It had been a place of both privilege and hardship, a gilded cage where she had experienced the extremes of human emotion. With a deep breath, Sarah stepped out of the cab, her chin held high. She was no longer the timid, wide-eyed girl who had arrived at the seminary years ago. She was a young woman now, tempered by adversity, strengthened by resilience, and emboldened by the knowledge of her own worth. As she approached the entrance, the heavy oak doors swung open, revealing the familiar figure of Miss Minchin. The headmistress stood tall and imposing, her face a mask of disapproval. Miss Crewe, she greeted curtly, her voice dripping with disdain. I trust you have come to settle your outstanding debts? Sarah met her gaze with unwavering composure. Indeed, Miss Minchin, she replied, her voice calm and measured. I have come to bid you farewell and to inform you that I am withdrawing from your establishment. Miss Minchin's eyebrows arched in surprise. Withdrawing? she repeated, her voice laced with incredulity. But your education is not yet complete. You have much to learn. Sarah smiled, a hint of amusement in her eyes. I have learned far more than you could ever teach me, Miss Minchin, she retorted. I have learned the value of kindness, the importance of compassion, and the true meaning of friendship. Miss Minchin's lips tightened into a thin line. You are a foolish girl, she snapped. You are throwing away a golden opportunity. You will regret this decision. Sarah shook her head, her smile widening. I have no regrets, Miss Minchin, she said. I am leaving this place with my head held high, my heart filled with gratitude for the lessons I have learned, and my spirit eager for the adventures that lie ahead. With that, she turned and walked away, her footsteps echoing through the empty hallway. As she reached the front door, she paused, glancing back at Miss Minchin. Goodbye, Miss Minchin, she said, her voice soft yet firm. I wish you all the best. Then, without another word, she opened the door and stepped out into the bright sunshine. The world outside seemed to shimmer with possibilities, a stark contrast to the dark and oppressive atmosphere of the seminary. As she climbed back into the cab, Sarah couldn't help but feel a sense of exhilaration. She was finally free, free to chart her own course, to follow her dreams, and to live a life that was truly her own. The cab rattled away, leaving Miss Minchin's seminary behind. Sarah leaned back against the plush cushions, her eyes closed, her mind racing with plans for the future. She knew that the road ahead would not be easy. There would be challenges to overcome, obstacles to surmount, and decisions to be made. But she was ready for anything, armed with the lessons she had learned and the unwavering support of her friends. Her first stop was the modest dwelling of her dear friend Ermengarde. The sight of Ermengarde's beaming face and the warm embrace she received filled Sara's heart with joy. They spent the afternoon catching up, sharing stories and laughter, and reminiscing about their time at the seminary. As the sun began to set, Sara took her leave, promising to visit again soon. 
she had made arrangements to stay at a comfortable hotel until she could find a more permanent residence. But even in the impersonal surroundings of the hotel room, Sarah felt a sense of peace and contentment. She was no longer a prisoner of Miss Minchin's rigid rules and expectations. She was a free spirit, ready to explore the world and embrace all that life had to offer. In the days that followed, Sarah immersed herself in the vibrant life of London. She visited museums and art galleries, attended lectures and concerts, and explored the city's hidden corners. She also reconnected with old friends and made new acquaintances, her social circle expanding with each passing day. One evening, as she was strolling through Hyde Park, she encountered a familiar figure. It was Ram Das, the Indian gentleman who had befriended her during her time at the seminary. Ram Das greeted her with a warm smile and a respectful bow. Miss Crewe, he said, his voice filled with admiration. It is a pleasure to see you again. Sarah returned his smile, her heart filled with gratitude for his kindness and support. Ram Das, she replied, it is wonderful to see you as well. They spent the next hour chatting animatedly, catching up on each other's lives. Ram Das told her about his travels and his ongoing efforts to bridge the cultural divide between India and England. Sarah, in turn, shared her plans for the future, her dreams of using her newfound wealth and influence to make a positive impact on the world. As they parted ways, Ram Das handed Sarah a small, intricately carved box. This is for you, he said, his eyes twinkling. A token of my esteem and a reminder that you are never truly alone. Sarah accepted the gift with a grateful heart. She knew that Ram Das' words were true. She had a network of friends and supporters who believed in her, who encouraged her, and who would always be there for her. With renewed determination, Sarah set about creating a new life for herself. She purchased a charming house in a quiet neighborhood, furnished it with exquisite taste, and surrounded herself with beauty and comfort. She also hired a staff of loyal and dedicated servants, ensuring that her every need was met. But Sarah's life was not just about material comforts. She continued her philanthropic endeavors, donating generously to charities and causes that were close to her heart. She also became a vocal advocate for education and social justice, using her platform to speak out against injustice and inequality. As the years passed, Sarah's reputation grew. She was admired for her intelligence, her compassion, and her unwavering commitment to making the world a better place. She was sought after for her advice and counsel, her opinion valued by those in power. But through it all, Sarah never forgot the lessons she had learned at Miss Minchin's seminary. She never lost sight of the importance of kindness, compassion, and friendship. And she never stopped believing in the power of dreams. The worn leather of Sarah's travel bag creaked in protest as she hoisted it onto her shoulder. She paused on the doorstep, glancing back at the familiar silhouette of the cottage. It had been home for a time, a haven from the harsh realities of the world. But today, a new journey beckoned. With a resolute nod, she turned and stepped onto the path leading towards the village. The morning air was crisp, carrying the scent of pine and damp earth. Birdsong filled the spaces between the trees, a chorus of welcome as Sara made her way through the woods. Her heart was light, buoyed by a sense of purpose. Today, she was not just embarking on another adventure, she was rescuing a friend, Becky. The name conjured a whirlwind of emotions within Sara. They had met during a particularly tumultuous period in Sara's life, and Becky's unwavering friendship had been a lifeline. But their paths had diverged, leaving Becky trapped in a life of servitude and despair. Now, Sarah was determined to change that. As she neared the village, the sounds of bustling activity reached her ears. The marketplace was a riot of colors and smells, merchants hawking their wares and villagers bartering for goods. Sarah weaved through the crowds, her eyes scanning the faces around her. She knew that Becky's circumstances were dire, and time was of the essence. After a few inquiries and some discreet observation, Sarah found herself standing before a modest dwelling on the outskirts of the village. The windows were shuttered, and an air of neglect hung over the place. Taking a deep breath, she knocked on the door. The sound of shuffling footsteps approached, followed by the creak of a rusty hinge. The door opened a crack, revealing a face that Sarah barely recognized. 
Becky's once vibrant eyes were dull, her cheeks hollow, her hair unkempt. A pang of sorrow struck Sarah's heart. Becky, she whispered, her voice thick with emotion. Becky's eyes widened in surprise. A flicker of recognition sparked in their depths, followed by a wave of disbelief. Sarah? She breathed, her voice barely audible. Without another word, Sarah pushed the door open and stepped inside. The interior was dim and sparsely furnished, the air heavy with the scent of stale food and unwashed laundry. Becky stood frozen, her hands clasped nervously in front of her. What are you doing here? She asked, her voice trembling. Sarah reached out, taking Becky's hands in her own. They were cold and rough, a testament to the hardships she had endured. I've come to take you away, Sarah said, her voice firm. You don't belong here anymore. A look of mingled hope and fear crossed Becky's face. But how? I can't just leave. I have responsibilities. Not anymore, Sarah assured her. I've made arrangements. You're coming with me. The hours that followed were a whirlwind of activity. Sarah and Becky packed what few belongings they could carry, leaving behind the remnants of a life that had become a prison. As they slipped out of the village under the cover of darkness, Sarah could feel Becky's tension gradually easing. The prospect of freedom was a balm to her wounded spirit. Their journey took them through winding paths and hidden trails, away from prying eyes and inquisitive minds. Sarah led the way, her knowledge of the terrain honed from years of wandering. Becky followed, her steps hesitant at first, but growing more confident with each passing mile. As the days turned into nights, they found shelter in abandoned cabins and beneath starlit skies. Sarah shared stories of her travels, tales of daring escapes and exotic lands. Becky listened, her eyes wide with wonder, her heart yearning for a taste of the unknown. One evening, as they sat around a campfire, Becky turned to Sarah with a question that had been on her mind for days. Why are you doing this for me? She asked. We haven't seen each other in years. Why do you care? Sarah smiled, a warmth spreading through her chest. Because you're my friend, she said simply, and friends don't leave each other behind. Becky's eyes filled with tears. She reached out, embracing Sarah in a hug that spoke volumes. In that moment, a bond that had been forged in the fires of adversity was renewed, stronger than ever before. Their journey continued, taking them deeper into the heart of the wilderness. They encountered challenges along the way, from treacherous terrain to unexpected encounters with wildlife. But Sarah's resourcefulness and Becky's newfound resilience saw them through. One morning, as they crested a hill, a breathtaking vista unfolded before them. A vast expanse of rolling hills stretched towards the horizon, dotted with sparkling lakes and verdant forests. A sense of awe washed over them, a reminder of the beauty and majesty of the natural world. This is where we're going, Sarah said, pointing towards a distant mountain range. There's a hidden valley there, a place where we can start anew. Becky's heart soared. The promise of a fresh start, a life free from fear and oppression, filled her with hope. She took Sarah's hand, her grip firm and resolute. Together they descended the hill, their eyes fixed on the future, their hearts filled with gratitude for the reunion that had changed their lives forever. The hidden valley lived up to its promise. Nestled amidst towering peaks and lush greenery, it was a sanctuary of tranquility. A crystal clear stream meandered through the valley floor, its gentle murmur a soothing soundtrack to their new life. Wildflowers bloomed in vibrant profusion, painting the landscape in a kaleidoscope of colors. At the heart of the valley stood a charming cottage, its stone walls softened by climbing roses and its windows glinting in the sunlight. Sarah had discovered it during one of her earlier expeditions, and it had remained etched in her memory as a place of refuge. Now, it was to be their home. With a sense of joyful anticipation, Sarah and Becky crossed the threshold. The interior was a haven of warmth and comfort. Sunlight streamed through the windows, illuminating the polished wooden floors and the tastefully arranged furniture. A crackling fire danced in the hearth, casting a welcoming glow over the room. Becky gasped in delight. It's beautiful, she exclaimed, her eyes wide with wonder. Sarah smiled, her heart swelling with happiness. Welcome home, she said, her voice filled with warmth. 
The following days were a whirlwind of activity as they settled into their new abode. Sarah, with her innate resourcefulness, transformed the cottage into a haven of comfort and luxury. She unearthed hidden treasures from her travels, adorning the walls with tapestries and filling the shelves with exotic artifacts. Becky, eager to contribute, took charge of the garden. With her green thumb and Sarah's guidance, she transformed the overgrown plot into a vibrant oasis of fruits, vegetables and herbs. The scent of lavender and rosemary mingled with the sweet fragrance of honeysuckle, creating a symphony of scents that filled the air. As the seasons turned, their lives settled into a comfortable rhythm. Mornings were spent tending to the garden, gathering fresh produce for their meals. Afternoons were devoted to exploring the surrounding wilderness, discovering hidden waterfalls and secret grottos. Evenings were spent around the fire, sharing stories and laughter, their hearts filled with gratitude for the life they had built together. One crisp autumn day, as they sat on the porch enjoying the golden hues of the landscape, Becky turned to Sarah with a question that had been on her mind for some time. Sarah, she began, her voice hesitant, I've been meaning to ask you, what are your plans for the future? Sarah paused, her gaze sweeping over the valley they had come to love. This is my future, she said, her voice filled with conviction. I've spent years wandering, searching for a place to call home, and I've found it here with you. Becky's heart skipped a beat, a wave of warmth washed over her, filling her with a sense of belonging she had never known before. I feel the same way, she confessed, her voice barely a whisper. In that moment, a silent understanding passed between them. They had both endured hardships, faced loss and adversity, but they had found solace and strength in each other's company. The bond they shared was unbreakable, a testament to the enduring power of friendship. As the years passed, their love for each other deepened. They celebrated birthdays and holidays together, creating traditions that were uniquely their own. They supported each other's dreams and aspirations, cheering each other on through triumphs and setbacks. One winter evening, as the snow fell softly outside, Sarah surprised Becky with a gift. It was a locket, crafted from silver and adorned with a delicate engraving of their initials. Becky's eyes filled with tears as she opened the locket. Inside, she found a tiny photograph of the two of them, taken on the day they had arrived in the valley. Sarah, she whispered, her voice thick with emotion. This is the most beautiful gift I've ever received. Sarah smiled, her eyes filled with love. It's a symbol of our friendship, she said, a reminder that we'll always be there for each other, no matter what. Becky nodded, her heart overflowing with gratitude. She reached out, taking Sarah's hand in her own. Their fingers intertwined, a silent promise of a future filled with love, laughter and unwavering companionship. As they sat by the fire, watching the flames dance and flicker, a sense of contentment washed over them. They had found their sanctuary, their haven from the storms of life, and they knew with absolute certainty that they would never be alone again. The air crackled with anticipation as Mr. Carrisford unfurled the weathered map on the table. Its faded lines and cryptic symbols held the key to a secret that had haunted him for years, the location of the legendary diamond mines of Africa. Beside him, Sarah leaned in, her eyes tracing the intricate details with a scholar's intensity. This is it, Mr. Carrisford declared, his voice thick with emotion. The culmination of a lifetime of research, the map that will lead us to untold riches. Sarah nodded, a thrill of excitement coursing through her veins. The prospect of adventure, of unraveling a mystery that had baffled explorers for centuries, ignited a spark within her. She had always been drawn to the unknown, to the thrill of discovery, and now she was on the cusp of an expedition that could change her life forever. Together, they pored over the map, deciphering its cryptic clues. It spoke of hidden valleys, treacherous ravines, and ancient landmarks. It whispered of a fortune waiting to be claimed, of a legacy that could be theirs for the taking. Days turned into nights as they immersed themselves in the task. They consulted dusty tomes and consulted with experts in geography and cartography. They cross-referenced the map's markings with satellite imagery and geological surveys. Slowly but surely, a clearer picture began to emerge. The mines are located in a remote region of the Kalahari Desert, Sarah announced one evening, 
her voice brimming with confidence. The map indicates a series of natural formations that will guide us to the entrance. Mr. Carrisford's eyes gleamed with excitement. Then we must make preparations at once, he declared, his voice ringing with determination. We shall assemble a team of experts, gather supplies, and set off on this grand adventure. The weeks that followed were a whirlwind of activity. Sarah and Mr. Carrisford meticulously planned every detail of the expedition. They recruited a team of seasoned adventurers, each with their own unique skills and expertise. They procured sturdy vehicles, state-of-the-art equipment, and enough provisions to last them for months. Finally, the day of departure arrived. The team assembled at a remote airstrip, their faces etched with a mixture of anticipation and apprehension. The Kalahari Desert was a harsh and unforgiving environment, known for its scorching temperatures, treacherous sandstorms, and deadly wildlife. But the lure of the diamonds was too strong to resist. With a roar of engines, the plane lifted off, soaring into the clear blue sky. Below, the vast expanse of the African savanna stretched towards the horizon, a tapestry of golden grasslands and acacia trees. Sarah gazed out the window, her heart filled with a sense of wonder and possibility. After several hours of flight, they landed on a makeshift runway in the heart of the desert. The air was thick with the scent of dust and sun-baked earth. A shimmering heat haze danced on the horizon, distorting the landscape into a surreal mirage. The team disembarked, their boots crunching on the parched earth. They loaded their supplies onto sturdy all-terrain vehicles and set off into the unknown. Days turned into weeks as they navigated the treacherous terrain. The sun beat down relentlessly, turning the sand into a scorching oven. Sandstorms whipped up without warning, obscuring their vision and threatening to bury them alive. But they persevered, their spirits buoyed by the promise of riches that lay ahead. Along the way, they encountered a variety of challenges. They had to contend with venomous snakes, aggressive scorpions, and prowling hyenas. They had to ration their water and conserve their energy. But they also witnessed the breathtaking beauty of the desert, its stark landscapes and vibrant sunsets. One evening, as they huddled around a campfire, Sarah noticed a peculiar formation in the distance. It was a towering rock spire, its silhouette resembling a pointing finger. Could that be one of the landmarks mentioned in the map? She wondered aloud. Mr. Carrisford squinted, examining the formation through his binoculars. It certainly matches the description, he confirmed, his voice filled with excitement. Let's investigate. The following morning they set off towards the rock spire, as they drew closer, they discovered a hidden entrance concealed behind a curtain of cascading vines. With bated breath, they pushed their way through the foliage and stepped into the darkness beyond. The air inside was cool and damp, a welcome respite from the desert heat. They lit their torches, illuminating a narrow passageway that descended into the depths of the earth. As they ventured deeper, the passageway widened into a series of cavernous chambers. Stalactites and stalagmites adorned the walls, creating a surreal subterranean landscape. The air was filled with the sound of dripping water and the echo of their own footsteps. After what seemed like an eternity, they emerged into a vast underground chamber. The sight that greeted them took their breath away. The walls were encrusted with diamonds, sparkling like a million stars in the torchlight. A gasp of awe escaped Sarah's lips. We found it she whispered, her voice trembling with emotion. Mr. Carrisford nodded, his eyes wide with wonder. The diamond mines of Africa, he murmured, his voice filled with reverence. We have achieved the impossible. They spent the next few days exploring the mines, marveling at their vastness and the sheer abundance of diamonds. They carefully documented their findings, mapping out the tunnels and chambers, and collecting samples of the precious stones. As they prepared to leave, Sarah paused taking one last look at the glittering spectacle before her. She knew that this was a moment she would cherish forever, a testament to the power of perseverance and the thrill of discovery. With a sense of accomplishment and a newfound appreciation for the hidden treasures of the earth, they made their way back to the surface. The sun was setting as they emerged from the hidden entrance, casting long shadows across the desert floor. As they drove away, Sara glanced back at the rock spire, its silhouette now bathed in the warm glow of the evening sky. 
She knew that the diamond mines would always hold a special place in her heart. A reminder of the extraordinary adventure she had shared with Mr. Carrisford and the unwavering spirit of exploration that had brought them together. The echoing silence of the underground chamber was broken only by the rhythmic dripping of water and the hushed whispers of awe. Sarah and Mr. Carrisford stood transfixed, their torches illuminating the breathtaking sight before them. The walls shimmered and sparkled, a mesmerizing dance of light refracted through countless facets. It was a subterranean palace adorned with nature's most precious jewels, diamonds. Sarah reached out, her fingers tracing the rough surface of the wall. A gasp escaped her lips as she dislodged a small stone, its brilliance catching the torchlight like a captured star. She held it up to her eye, marveling at its clarity and the way it seemed to dance with an inner fire. It's real, she breathed, her voice filled with wonder. A genuine diamond. Mr. Carrisford nodded, his eyes gleaming with excitement. This is it, Sarah, he declared, his voice echoing through the chamber. We found the diamond mines of Africa. A wave of exhilaration washed over Sarah. They had done it. They had achieved what countless others had only dreamed of. The legendary mines, lost for centuries, were now theirs to claim. Over the next few days, they explored the vast network of tunnels and chambers that comprised the mines. Each turn revealed new wonders, clusters of diamonds clinging to the walls like crystalline grapes, shimmering rivulets of water flowing over diamond-encrusted rocks, and even a hidden waterfall cascading down a wall of pure diamond. The sheer abundance of the gems was staggering. They were everywhere, in every size and shape imaginable. There were tiny chips, no bigger than grains of sand, and massive stones, the size of a human fist. There were rough, uncut diamonds, their natural beauty waiting to be unveiled, and polished, faceted gems, their brilliance rivaling the stars. With each discovery, Sarah's heart swelled with a mixture of joy and disbelief. She had always known that the mines were a possibility, a distant dream whispered in hushed tones and hinted at in cryptic maps. But to actually stand here, amidst this subterranean treasure trove, was almost too much to comprehend. They meticulously documented their findings, carefully mapping out the layout of the mines and cataloging the different types of diamonds they found. They collected samples, filling their bags with the most exquisite specimens, each one a testament to their incredible discovery. As they prepared to leave, Sarah paused, taking one last look at the glittering spectacle before her. She knew that this was a moment she would cherish forever, a turning point in her life. The diamonds represented more than just wealth and security. They were a symbol of her perseverance, her resilience, and her unwavering belief in the power of dreams. With a newfound sense of purpose and a heart filled with gratitude, Sarah and Mr. Carrisford made their way back to the surface. The sun was setting as they emerged from the hidden entrance, casting long shadows across the desert floor. News of their discovery spread like wildfire. The world was captivated by the tale of the lost diamond mines of Africa and the intrepid explorers who had found them. Sarah and Mr. Carrisford became overnight celebrities, their names synonymous with adventure and fortune. The diamonds they had brought back with them were valued at an astronomical sum, securing Sarah's financial future for generations to come. She was no longer a penniless orphan, but a woman of immense wealth and influence. But Sarah knew that the true value of the diamonds lay not in their monetary worth, but in the lessons they had taught her. They had taught her the importance of perseverance, the power of dreams, and the enduring spirit of adventure. With her newfound wealth, Sarah established a foundation dedicated to helping others in need. She funded schools, hospitals, and orphanages, providing opportunities for those who had been less fortunate than herself. She also invested in research and exploration, ensuring that the legacy of the diamond mines would continue to inspire future generations. As she looked back on her journey, Sarah realized that the diamonds had not only changed her life, but also the lives of countless others. They had given her the means to make a difference in the world, to leave a lasting legacy that would extend far beyond her own lifetime. And so, the discovery of the diamond mines marked not just the end of one chapter in Sarah's life, but the beginning of a new one. A chapter filled with hope, purpose, and the unwavering belief that anything is possible if you dare to dream. 
The echoes of laughter filled the air as children raced through the sun-dappled gardens of the Grand Estate. Their joyous squeals mingled with the melodic chirping of birds, creating a symphony of happiness that resonated throughout the sprawling grounds. Sara watched them from the shade of a sprawling oak tree, a smile gracing her lips. Years had passed since the discovery of the diamond mines, years filled with both challenges and triumphs. Sara's life had taken an extraordinary turn, propelling her from a penniless orphan to a woman of immense wealth and influence. Yet through it all, she had remained true to herself, her kindness and compassion unwavering. The estate, once a crumbling relic of a bygone era, had been transformed into a haven of beauty and tranquility. Lush gardens bloomed with exotic flowers, their vibrant colors a testament to Sara's love of nature. The once empty halls now echoed with the sounds of music and laughter, a testament to the joy she had brought into the lives of others. For Sara, the true wealth lay not in the diamonds themselves, but in the opportunities they had afforded her to make a difference in the world. She had established a foundation dedicated to helping the less fortunate, funding schools, hospitals and orphanages across the globe. She had also become a patron of the arts, supporting aspiring artists and musicians, fostering creativity and enriching the lives of countless individuals. But her greatest joy came from the children, who now called the estate their home. They were orphans, castaways of society, who had found refuge and love in Sara's embrace. She had opened her heart and her home to them, providing them with the care, education and opportunities they had been denied. As Sara watched the children play, her heart swelled with pride and gratitude. She had come so far from the lonely, impoverished girl who had once wandered the streets of Paris. She had overcome adversity, defied the odds, and created a life filled with purpose and meaning. One afternoon, as she strolled through the gardens, she came across a young girl sitting alone on a bench. The girl was lost in thought, her brow furrowed in concentration. Sara approached, her footsteps soft on the mossy path. Is everything all right, my dear? She inquired gently. The girl looked up, startled. Her eyes were filled with a mixture of sadness and hope. I was just thinking about my parents, she confessed, her voice barely a whisper. I miss them so much. Sara sat down beside her, taking her hand in hers. I know how you feel, she said softly. I lost my parents when I was very young, but I learned that love can be found in many forms. It can be found in the kindness of strangers, the warmth of friendship, and the joy of helping others. The girl nodded, a glimmer of understanding in her eyes. You're right, she said. I'm so grateful for everything you've done for me. You've given me a home, a family, and a chance to dream. Sarah smiled, her heart overflowing with love. You're a part of my family now, she assured her, and I'll always be here for you, no matter what. The girl threw her arms around Sarah, her hug filled with gratitude and affection. In that moment, Sarah knew that she had found her true calling. She had been given a second chance at life, and she was determined to use it to spread love, hope, and happiness wherever she went. As the years passed, the estate became a beacon of hope, a place where dreams could flourish and lives could be transformed. Sarah's kindness and generosity touched the lives of countless individuals, from the children who called her Mama Sarah to the countless others who benefited from her philanthropic endeavors. One day, as Sara sat in her study, surrounded by books and mementos of her travels, she received a letter that brought tears to her eyes. It was from a young woman who had grown up in one of the orphanages she had funded. The woman had gone on to become a doctor, dedicating her life to helping others in need. You gave me the chance to dream, the letter read. You showed me that even a penniless orphan can achieve great things. I will never forget your kindness, and I will always strive to live a life that would make you proud. Sara folded the letter, a warm glow spreading through her chest. She had always believed that the true measure of a person's wealth was not in the amount of money they possessed, but in the positive impact they had on the world. And in that moment, she knew that she had lived a life that was truly rich. As the sun set over the estate, Casting long shadows across the gardens, Sara stepped out onto the balcony to admire the view. The air was filled with the sounds of laughter and music, a testament to the joy and happiness that filled the once empty halls. Sara smiled, her heart filled with contentment. 
She had found her place in the world, a place where she could make a difference, a place where she could be surrounded by love, laughter, and the unwavering support of her chosen family. She had found her happy ending. Sarah Crew's story reminds us that even in the darkest of times, kindness, imagination, and resilience can light the way. Thank you for joining us at Storytime Haven for this heartwarming adventure. Don't forget to subscribe for more enchanting tales and magical journeys. Until next time, keep dreaming and believing in the power of stories.